Hello and welcome to yet another video, and in this video it is something special because I'll be talking about this camera right here. It's the original 1DX without the mark, as you can see. This camera has been out for a while now, I know, but this camera pretty much has been my favorite camera since I got it, which was only a few weeks ago. Um, that means I got a second hand, of course, but I got a chance to actually shoot a proper wedding with this camera. Like, it was my first wedding since the pandemic, pretty much, and also this camera proved to be a really, really tough reliable camera and in this video I'll explain why it has become my favorite camera even though I have the 5D line of cameras and also the uh, EOS R and everything so yeah without further ado let's get into the video So the Canon EOS 1DX, this camera has been out for a while now, I know, but this camera is still very, very, very capable for what it is today and especially for the price that you can get it for. And this camera, in my opinion, is still like a camera to consider when you're getting like into a professional camera or looking for a backup professional camera. And you know, I got mine for around 800 euros, obviously in many countries you can get it a bit more expensive or cheaper give or take and also the shutter actuation the condition of the camera mine is pretty much in a mint condition even though i put a dent on it myself before i dive into the video i would like to talk about the dent um before before i forget about it because this dent is like a huge thing i don't know why but whenever i get a really good deal in my opinion a good deal in a camera i tend to have accidents with the camera so on the day when I had wedding, this camera had the 85 1.2 Mark II uh, on the camera itself and I was walking and swinging around because I had my 5D Mark III, my EOS R, my other camera, either it was the 5D Mark II or um, another 1D camera, I, I forgot. Uh, anyway, so it was really a lot and also my camera bag with a lot of like L lenses inside, so it was really a lot to swing around and everything and this camera fell like to the ground from pretty good height like around here because I was really operating different cameras and everything and this camera fell to the ground like it was a concrete ground because it was on the street and um, it felt this side first boom and then it bounced a couple of times and even though it still looked like it's in a mint condition despite this one little scratch uh, if you look at the skull, this side is completely synced down, not completely, but just it's synced down more than this side. So if you put a ruler here, it's actually a little slope. And this was completely closed, so I had to use a screwdriver and pretty much put this back up so that I can mount a flash. So yeah, but that also proved to be like, you know, show how tough this camera is because given the weight of the camera and also the weight of the 85 1.2, a normal camera, in my opinion, like a normal entry to camera that's made out of plastic would probably have broken to little pieces as well, so because it was really heavy and it was actually from a height. So anyway, with that out of the way, let me actually get into the video. In this video, I'll be talking about the operational side of things, as well as the ergonomics, the um, pros and cons, the image quality, the video quality, and uh, pretty much my conclusion. So yeah. Because this camera has already like tons of reviews out there, this is not a review video, I have to make that clear. It's pretty much my thought, just like any other videos I make about the cameras. They're my thought videos because I've used them, I'm just talking about it from my experience. So, let me first start with the operational side of things and usability, ergonomics, things like that. This camera feels actually bigger than the original 1D line of cameras, like the 1D Mark II, 1D, 1D Mark III, 1D Mark IV, things like that. And it's just... It feels heavier as well, so when I do go back to like one of my 1D cameras, uh, it makes it feel like the, these ones are more compact. And they're actually smaller in size, but yeah, never mind. <laughs> but the, this camera is actually really, really comfortable to hold, despite the weight. It's suddenly made for people with bigger hands or people wearing gloves as well. So yeah, but you like once you actually hold the camera, you really feel that it's really solidly made and that you, like even though you dropped it like maybe harsher than the way I did it will still survive and opening the rubber gaskets and everything the 
flaps, sorry, the ports, you will feel that the weather sealing, the thickness of the rubber has been enhanced. So yeah, shooting in rain and shooting in dust storms and things like that wouldn't be a problem. And after the pandemic is over, I mean, I'm, I travel a lot to like other tropical countries and everything and a camera that is really reliable in those weather conditions in tropical countries like typhoon and heat wave, things like that. Having a camera that's reliable in those conditions is also important. And moving on to the next point, which is the menu system. I would like to touch on the menu system a little bit as well. It's a typical Canon menu system. It, like if you're used to the 5D Mark III, you'll be used to this uh, menu system very well. This menu system will actually allow you to customize the camera quite a fair bit and I have customized this camera to the way I really want it to use and there are actually quite a few function buttons on here which you can actually customize to your own needs as well which is good. And even though this camera added quite a few features compared to the 1DS Mark III and the 1D Mark IV, the menu system is still fairly simple to use. This camera doesn't have like all the uh, features that you may not use or all the features that just like fancy gimmick features so everything is just stripped down to the essentials so that's pretty good as well about this camera which means you can access the menu quite well the screen is what i like as well the coating is really good it's the same coating and the screen design as the 5d mark iii i believe so that means you can still see the camera screen in daily like in normal daylight so you don't have to cover your screen like this and it's not too reflective so it's still definitely workable. The viewfinder despite being a 100% viewfinder and also pretty much the same viewfinder design as many other professional cameras from Canon, uh, the viewfinder in there is also customizable. You can lay different um, kind of settings on there or different kind of things that you want to show in the viewfinder. And you also can set the actual autofocusing points to be your level if you want by just pressing the uh, multifunction button. Um, yeah, it's, it's really nice and quick. You can just also play around with how you want to uh, place your autofocusing points in there, which is great. It's way more customizable than the 1D Mark IV, 1DS Mark III, things like that. But if you're coming from like 5D Mark III, 7D Mark II, things like that, it's really, really familiar and you'll be at home with that. The, uh, the only downside is that it's not a touch screen. And even though the 1DX Mark II, it is a touch screen, but it's also very limited on that camera. So yeah, I wish that the screen would actually be a touch screen, especially during live view. That would actually save a lot of time. So yeah, but it's not. Another thing I like is um, the dual CF card slots. During the 1D Mark III and the 1D Mark IV, it has been a dual card slot as well, but it's the CF and SD. So as my 5D line, it's CF and SD. I like having dual CF cards simply because I don't like SD cards. Even on the 5D line of cameras, it has CF and SD but I just don't use the SD card. So for me, the dual card slot still feels like a one card slot because I really don't like SD cards. You can get professional grade SD card slot, uh, sorry, SD cards, but from my like experience, I haven't done any scientific test on it, but just purely experience, the SD cards just fails way more than the CF cards and they're not as rugged or sturdy as, this, as the CF cards. Obviously, um, the CF card slots will, you know, the lifetime is shorter than the SD card slots. That's nature because there are pins inside. So, you know, both has its own advantages and disadvantages. So, yeah, but for me, I, I really would really want to have uh, CF cards or CFAS cards, um, the bigger ones. So... Yeah, there's that. Other than that, this camera is built pretty much like a tank. It's really solidly built, as I mentioned. I really love um, how each button feels on this camera. And I also love the fact that this camera is more like independent when operating. Like you don't need multi fingers to press all over the place to get to one function like the older 1D generation cameras do. So with this, you don't need like any sort of combination of buttons. Oh, sorry, yeah, combination of buttons or uh, press things to get to certain functions that you want. You just press and then adjust, which is really, really good. And um, a nice added function or buttons that you find on this camera is actually uh, the ISO button, which is kind of like a differently designed, but it's also really nice to 
have or feel and know that you're actually pressing on the ISO button because it's such a essential button that like, you know, if you're shooting on a quick like this, if you, let's say if you're shooting wedding or photojournalism and you need to get to the ISO quickly, it's just really nicely designed and it's just a small detail that you know makes such a huge huge difference but that's you know towards how i shoot this camera also has 12 frames per second which i really haven't used that much yet we're still in the pandemic as of this recording time and i haven't had a chance to really shoot like proper burst rate with this camera so i haven't really got a chance to test how the autofocusing system really fares up when i'm shooting that 12 frames per second uh, even when the, like doing the wedding that I had because it was even though it was set in place it set in a place like really big But the guests were really really little only family members were invited and that was just like the best man and the maid of honor and um, The father mother of the groom and the bride things like that. So that was pretty much it. So despite this huge hall that we had um, only little amount of guests was there and therefore not a lot of action so I didn't even get a chance to really test that tall from so seconds and even if I did it would actually be quite awkward in the way that because it was such a small group of people any sound I make even walking on the tiles in the uh, big hall made sound so I felt really awkward even moving around so yeah I didn't really get a chance to test out that 12 frames per second but it's there. Another thing that I really like from this camera is that they finally have dual joysticks. Compared to the previous 1D cameras, which only pretty much had one joystick, which is kind of weird, like the 1D Mark IV, the 1D Mark III, they all had only one joystick, for example. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, but like on my 1D Mark III, I only have one joystick, which is kind of weird because when you add like a battery grip to some of the uh, semi-professional cameras from Canon, uh, they give you another door uh, another joystick there as well. So yeah, it's it's kind of weird on that And one last thing in terms of usability that I wish this camera would have built in is either Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or NFC and or everything I know there's a module Wi-Fi transmitter mo module that you can actually purchase an add-on but yeah, I just wish it would just be built in as well just for like simple Instagram or simple You know transfer to your phone and then you can just send some of the images to your clients right away I know that this camera was built like a tank so the signal out of the camera shell wouldn't be as strong That's why the 1DX Mark II had this um, kind of line cut out for a special module to really sit inside and being able to transfer or transmit signals to other devices and yeah and if you're working professionally in the field like shooting olympics or shooting world cup or other sports um it's just better to have uh the actual dedicated module wi-fi because those are going to be more reliable and it's just works for better for other professional softwares and systems so yeah there's that but you know it's just but yeah, it would just be nice to just have the ability to just download a few images and just send over to your clients so that they can share on social media quickly as well and not having to wait for you to actually go home, edit some images and send some previews. Yeah, it's just a little nitpicking, but obviously this camera wasn't really made for that, but it would have been nice to have it. <laughs> so now just going to the image quality, pros and cons, the video quality out of this camera as well. This camera, well, as I mentioned earlier, I just got it like not that long ago, just a short while ago, and I haven't really put it through its professional faces yet, only through like random shoots around the neighborhood, one proper wedding photo shoot, things like that. So no professional video shoots as I've done with all the other cameras that I've talked about in the videos, in like previous videos. So I can't really share from the professional side of things that much, but from just using it, it's still a really, really capable camera in my opinion. So for photography, yes, the con would be the 18 megapixels because nowadays full frame cameras, you know, the standards are like 24 megapixels and my EOS R is 30 megapixels. My 5D Mark III has a bit higher than 20 megapixels. I think it's like 22 or 23 megapixels, I'm not sure. But just bring it up to like 20 megapixels like the 1DX Mark II would have been nice. Two megapixels isn't a lot, but 
it actually adds to a little bit of the detail that you get. Not from cropping, but you can still see a tiny bit of detail, especially when modern monitors are getting more and more resolution packs in them. So yeah, it just would have been nice as well. But that's just a tiny con. But this camera still delivers really nice image quality. I absolutely love the color science from this camera. When I got this camera, I just wanted to have it as part of my collection because I have the original 1D, 1D Mark III, and I just wanted to have the 1DX because it was my dream camera back in, when I was in 10th grade, things like that. But using it for, as like a backup or a B camera for the wedding kind of made me fall in love with this camera purely be because of the image quality. Even though having the more modern camera from Canon, like uh, the 70D, 80D and everything, and also the EOS R line of cameras. My favorite color signs from all the Canon cameras has been the 5D Mark III until I got this camera. And this camera is better than my 5D Mark III. I'm not saying that this camera has the most dynamic range in the world or out of all the Canon cameras that I have. No, it doesn't. My EOS R has more dynamic range, has better file detail, and is more efficient with that camera as well, and has a lot more features. But the color signs itself, the color reproduction, the roll off to the highlights and the shadows, everything just looks so much better on this camera and also more natural on this camera. Just what I really love. I love a camera that gives me such a natural looking file but also really nice crispy looking file as well even though it doesn't have high megapixel count and this does that. The roll off into the highlights and shadows are really good looking and man it's just so nice. I really paused for a while when I first got the chance to look at the images from the camera onto my monitor when I was shooting wedding uh, on the monitor of the computer and you know, every time I go through all of the images, comparing, like, not comparing, but just, like, seeing from the different perspective that I shoot from, I always recognize which, ca like, which photo was taken with the, like, uh, 1DX, because it was just so much better, so much more natural, but also crispy. In the same time that I cannot really explain, the contrast was just right, the color, the skin tone was just right. And it only needed a little bit of tweaking, like lens correction, contrast, just to add a little bit of my own aesthetics in there. But yeah, I really love cameras that deliver files that I don't need to spend a lot of time on, which actually makes a lot of sense when you think about it, because this camera is the 1DX. It's a sports camera. It's a camera that a lot of photographers will have in the stadium and it will be wirelessly transferred over to the editor sitting in the room, the editing room, and they need to get the files out to the public, to the press as soon as possible. So having like even a second, one second less of a workflow actually will justify their career. So it really makes a lot of sense. Whereas something like a 5D Mark III, you know, it's meant for a different kind of shoot. It's also for those people who will have more time to edit or prefer to edit. Whereas people who own this kind of camera will have lesser time to edit or prefer just giving the camera right away. Photojournalists who may not have editing as priority because some people, or actually a lot of press companies, prefer having like images that aren't edited so that it's more realistic to the people and more moral and ethical as well so yeah it really makes a lot of sense and man i really love the file from this camera that's pretty much all i can say just the color signs everything this camera really blew me away and right after that shoot like right after i um actually handed all of the photos to my clients I looked at the 1DX Mark II right away and was that close to buying it, but I think I might wait a few more months and see what uh, comes. Because right now the price on the 1DX Mark II brand new is just 3,000 euros versus 6,000 uh, 6, euros when it was still available. It's really expensive here in the Netherlands. I know it could be around like 5,500 euros um, brand new in Germany. Um, for 6,000 euros here, but you know, tax reasons as well. So, but anyway, nowadays you can get it, get it brand new for like around 3,000 euros, which is still like a bargain for that camera. So I'm just hoping to upgrade to that camera 
one's work starts to come in a bit more. So yeah, there's that. In terms of video quality, this is something like, it's better than my 5D Mark III in my opinion. Um, I love the colors way more, but you can just, like with the grading, you can do just as much as you can with the 5D Mark III, to be honest with you. The compression and everything is just, there might be minor different, but you're just looking at like a hair difference. But yeah, if you have a 5D Mark III, the video is pretty much just as good on there as on the 1DX. Uh, yes, to many like extent, if you don't edit your image a lot, the image on here, like the video output can look a little bit more organic, so to speak. So yeah, but the 5D Mark III will have more features dedicated to video than the 1DX here, the original one, because the 5D Mark II will have the headphone jack. This one doesn't, but the 1DC actually has the headphone jack. Um, the 5D Mark III will have a touch um, pad, which this, in my um, limited experience, I don't think it's a touch pad. So you cannot silently adjust your audio just by tapping during recording. And for live view on here, you have to pick either live view for stills or live view for video. You cannot have live view for both as you can for the Mark III. Because on here, you have to go into the menu and select for stills or for videos, just like the 5D Mark II had. So yeah, there's that. Um, the downside is it doesn't have dual pixel AF, like the newer Canon cameras, which if this had the dual pixel AF, I would really would love to use this uh, for many shoots because even though it only shoots 1080p, it's sh it shoots really, really good 1080p from this camera. And I don't really need a lot of grading with this camera on it, like just shooting video because the color is just pretty much organic and it's already pretty good out of the camera. So yeah, but the 1DX Mark II, I'm definitely looking at that. It's soft video quality compared to like modern day standards, but it's still detailed enough to really use it for online content creation, short films, documentary, things like that. It's still pretty good quality. The next thing is actually the battery life. It's more of like usability, but also image quality at the same time. So you don't really need to worry about how long you can shoot because this battery will last you a long, long time. Like, I think I only charge once every two weeks. So yeah, but obviously this is not the only main camera I'm using. I'm using the X-T3, the X-T2, well the X-T3 is filming me right now, um, my 5D Mark III, uh, my EOS R, things like that. So those are also my main cameras. Uh, so battery life do get um, divided amongst those cameras as well. So yeah, that being said, there are issues with like if we just touch back on the usability a little bit there are issues with using third-party batteries in terms of charging so i heard that just like the original 1d line of cameras when it comes to charging depending on the third-party batteries you go for the original charger might not actually accept uh or charge the third-party batteries properly and you might need to buy the third-party chargers for those third-party batteries as well but they will work but they will work kind of nicely with the camera though i also have read that um some third-party cameras uh, sorry some third-party batteries will make the camera show no information uh, about the battery life on the camera itself so yeah just be careful which third-party batteries you do go for if you do buy into this camera so yeah, there's a little bit of that. I think it's kind of usability, but also kind of image and also video shooting in the same time because, you know, sometimes the battery life also dictates the quality that you want to shoot your video in or the amount of pictures you can really get. But you can really go by just one battery and just uh, have a lot of events or a lot of um, jobs done in just one battery so it's something that's really impressive so if you're doing a lot of traveling things like that just have two batteries and you might just be done with just one travel uh, if you're traveling for like half a week or one week and just leave the battery charger at home because the battery charger is actually quite big but if you have room for it feel free to take it it's also actually wiser to take your battery chargers as well but yeah <laughs> Lucky that this is not my main video camera and I'm not having a video shoot anytime soon. So, yeah. <laughs> anyway, into the conclusion. 
Anyway, into the conclusion. This camera, in my opinion, is a mixed bag. It's really great value for money, and if you're like me, I would definitely highly recommend it. But because of the size, of the weight, and the lenses that it actually only accepts, which is the EF lenses, it's not for everybody. You know, like, I love it for the reliability, the toughness, the speed of the camera, the autofocusing system of it. And talking about the autofocusing system and the reliability, image quality and everything, the one thing that I love about this camera that I have to get used to is that being an optical viewfinder, you, you don't see what you're exactly going to get in terms of the final image. And with my 5D Mark III, I have to sometimes underexpose or overexpose and everything, knowing like the metering might have it a tiny bit off uh, if I point it to the dark area or the bright area. But this camera seems to be smart. On here, just setting it to neutral zero, it just seems to know what object I'm trying to take pictures of. And yeah, it's just, it gives me the right exposure without having to underexpose or overexpose it. And therefore waste less shutter or waste less time taking pictures. And even though it's a DSLR and this is an optical viewfinder, most of the time, I just trust the camera that it will get the right exposure and the right settings and everything in place for me. The low light images from this camera is actually really usable. The detail out of this camera is great, the image file, and I would even use it at ISO 3200, ISO 4000, if you know what you're shooting, because not everything will look great at ISO 4000 or 5000. Just saying. So yeah. But in certain condition, you can really get by with 4,000 ISO and 5,000 ISO. As again, you just need to know what you're doing. And especially if you're just posting on social media, you can even use 6400 and do some cleanup with the noise and uh, you'll be fine. The autofocusing system, in my opinion, is still fast enough for a daily shoot. It's great for street photography as well, if you're into that, like if you're into the spontaneous and everything. I know that to most people it's kind of like an overkill as a street photography camera because it's size, people will notice and everything. But another reason why I choose to have this camera for my photography, is like street photography, is uh, I follow some photographers who uses like Nikon D4, Canon 1DX as their street photography camera and you kind of feel inspired and the images from those camera kind of look apart from some of the more compact cameras that most photographers would use for street photography. Um, there's something about those images and I would just like to really get into the mood of it. I know it's not really such a good time for it yet because we're still in the middle of pandemic and even more people are more going to be noticing, it, noticing this camera more. And from the social distancing, it's also hard to get into action anyway. And so now that there are a lot of people to be really photographing the street, during this time anyway so yeah there's that but i'm really hoping to really get into that anyway back into the uh conclusion i think that uh for the price um for the functionality this camera is a camera to really consider sure it doesn't have the highest meg megapixel count sure it doesn't have bluetooth wi-fi nfc what have you so the connectivity is not really there but if you don't need any of that, this camera is really good. Like I got mine for 800 euros and you can get it for roughly between 800 to 1000 euros. Still give or take, depending on you, where you live, you might get it for cheaper or more expensive. This camera came with barely scratches, that, uh, but I actually put scratches on there just from my first shoot already. Dropping it actually several times and also having it bang against other cameras around me. And yeah, I really gave a tough time for this camera as well. So it's really, really well built for this price range. And for this price range, you can get like a secondhand, um, other secondhand semi-professional cameras as well, which will have more features, but it will just not do 12 frames per second, which is really awesome on this camera. Um, Again, even though this camera might not have such a high megapixel count, but the images are really nice. I cannot really express how nice they are unless if you can actually come to my monitor and really look at it from like 
straight out of the camera. It's really that good. On the internet, after everything is compressed, it will just look like any files from like even 50D or something like that. So yeah, if you're a travel photographer, I think that this camera is still a good camera to have as like one camera that rules it all for everything. Unless if video plays 50% of your job, then this camera is obviously not there. Um, but if your job is just, yeah, travel photography and all you're just doing is documenting everything, then this camera is good. Like it's built rugged, you can get one of those wireless Wi-Fi cards to put inside if you really need to transfer the images wirelessly to your phone. Mobile devices, it will still do that, which is great for connectivity. So yeah, but this camera is very reliable, really rugged. The image quality is so good on this camera, I cannot express it enough. Um, it doesn't have the most dynamic range in the world, but... Uh, just the natural looking of the roll off to the highlights and shadows just makes it already really nice and natural looking because some cameras has a lot of dynamic range but the roll off is just so unnatural that you have to put a lot of effort into fixing it so you know it's yeah dynamic range is not always everything in the world but yeah that's pretty much where i'll leave it i know that it's been a really long video but long story short i do recommend this camera but you have to know that it's camera for you or not because just because I recommend something doesn't mean it's for everyone. Uh, in general, I still think it's a good camera to have and a camera that you can really fully trust it whether like wherever you bring it to. Anyway, um, I would like to wrap it up here. If you have any questions, please leave them down below. If you need a free photography guidebook, it's absolutely for free on my website. Just click and download. The link is down in the description below. Um, I'm not asking for your email address, you're not subscribing to anything, just click and download. So as my free 2021 photography um, calendar, so just the same digital download as well. So yeah, thank you very much for watching, stay safe, have fun shooting, bye.